So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, first of all, just want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. We're very excited. Um, I'm excited to be joined here by Dr. Chow and Nehal Patel to talk about building curriculum products in the 21st century. So just quickly, I'd like to do a quick run through of our agenda today. Uh, I'm going to start by doing a quick introduction. Then we're going to jump into how education products are typically and historically created. Uh, then start talking about the new approach that's really research-based and what the impacts are of that approach. At the end, as you'll see here, we will have 20 minutes for Q&A. So now, let's get started. And I would like to turn things over to Snehal, former math educator and the current founder and CEO of Sokicom. All right, thank you, Jen. <clears throat> um, Jen's not far. She's uh, just right over here on her uh, computer here. But uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, what would be kind of neat if you, you know, have a, a computer, uh, if you're sitting on a computer, uh, it'd be kind of neat maybe for everyone to just type in uh, where in the country you're from. Uh, we may even have some international folks um, with us today. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised, I think, when we sent the, the webinar invite out um, a week or so ago that we had over 70 uh, participants. We And actually, our, our WebEx was only capable of, I think, like 20 people, so we had to upgrade that and everything. So um, looking forward to the, the questions and kind of the, the dialogue even after the webinar. So it'd be you know, great to just uh, put in the uh, chat window um, where you're from, uh, if you're teaching at a school, you know, what school that is, just to get an idea of, you know, where all over the country uh, we have participants from. Um, I'll tell you a little bit my, about myself. Uh, prior to SOCICOM, I, um, let's see, I, I got my degree in computer science. I was a senior software engineer at Motorola. Um, I, I left that to start a, a math tutoring company called Mathnasium. And parallel to that, I actually taught um, prevention as well as after school programs in the South Phoenix area. Um, and um, while there, I had uh, some like really impactful experiences that inspired me to, uh, to start uh, SOPICOM. And as, as many of you may know, that uh, SOPICOM was started through um, multiple research grants from the U.S. Department of Education. So I uh, teamed up with uh, um, a number of researchers, including Dr. Teddy Chow, who um, will be talking in a little bit, and that ended up uh, one of the early stages of Stokie Council. So that was back in 2009, um, and very excited to speak with you today. We recently won another grant from the U.S. Department of Education, and I think we're going to address the, the research that we're doing there um, uh, later on in our call. Um, and uh, as Jen mentioned, I'm going to talk about Stokie I'll let uh, Dr. Chow and Dr. Kinsel for more about this. Uh, thank you, Jen. Oh, actually, let me. It would help if I unmuted you, uh, Dr. Chow. Okay. Oh, sorry. Was that, was that my call? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Theodore Chow, but. People know me, call me Teddy. Um, so, like, like see how I started off in software engineering as well as a computer science major <clears throat> back in college, um, and I left engineering uh, maybe about two years into my career because I, I, as much as fun as I like developing software, I um, <clears throat> found it to be not as fun as uh, teaching. So I started by tutoring my landlord's kids in their calculus and AP calculus classes, and found that that was much more fun <laughs> than anything I'd ever done in terms of engineering. And uh, from that, I ended up um, enrolling in a program in New York City, an alternative certification program, and got a master's degree in education, started teaching seventh and eighth grade in uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, South Williams Building at Bedford Stevenson. Um, and uh, from then, I, you know, I was in the classroom for a while, and I remember my, um, uh, my, my advisor for my, my, for my master's program really encouraging me to go to pursue a doctorate. And so I went to the University of Texas in Austin to get a 
doctorate in mathematics education, specializing specifically in um, elementary math uh, instruction and elementary mathematical thinking, um, working deeply with people from the cognitively guided instruction work um, in terms of rational knowledge. And then after that, I ended up at Harvard doing a postdoctoral uh, research fellowship uh, for the last two years. And when I was there, I um, also got to, I also had an office within the Harvard Business School. So I got to sit in um, and, you know, sort of combine my interest in terms of engineering, sort of entrepreneurship and innovation, and, you know, teacher education and how, um, you know, math is taught in the United States. And when I was there, I actually hooked up with uh, Sneha and Sokikam and uh, helping them sort of develop some of the curriculum they were doing. Really intrigued with the way that they were approaching um, elementary math education, which I think was a space that many people had a very sort of archaic traditional ideas about. And that Nihal, you know, because of his background was, you know, approaching it with a very sort of what we're going to talk about later, an agile software approach. And at the same time, was really taking a lot of effort to listen deeply to teachers and really get feedback from teachers in schools about how he could cater to what they wanted. And um, here we are, right? So Sneha and I have worked on some research together and now we're putting together, uh, we just put together a big grant and trying to get to find out <laughs> exactly uh, how teachers use SokiCom and how we can make SokiCom better. So maybe I'll transition into, um, you know, the history of mathematics games in the United States. So for those of you, you know, many of us are, are, are teachers or people from the classroom and I remember when I was a kid, you know, we used this program called MathMaster, which, you know, many people talk about as the first successful mathematics game. Um, I mean, a lot of these games sort of fall into the category of uh, uh, um, learning machines, right? Where the, this idea that you could sit a, a child in front of a computer or in front of a device and they would somehow, through pushing some buttons, learn math, right? Um, you know, <clears throat> we know that drill and um, Efficiency are very important to mathematical thinking, but unfortunately, that's they're only part of the bigger picture of, you know, understanding of the way a child thinks mathematically and understanding how to really access prior knowledge of a child, right? So for those of you who played these games, right, or, or had to use them in the classroom, you know, it, 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 there's a reason we don't really use them as much anymore because they're good for maybe remediation. They're good for maybe helping students who, you know, finish their work early and then have some fun playing. But in a game like Math Blaster or any other game in which all you're really doing is trying to come up with a multiplication fact or initial fact quickly, we're not really getting to the heart of numeracy. We're not really getting to the heart of how children create their own strategies and how they can adapt their strategies or understand other students' strategies, right? So there's been a, a, a real revolution in the last 10, 15 years of mathematics education research, specifically in how children think. And it's only now, in, in the last few years, that I think some of the technology and games, the curriculum, have sort of caught up with what we know about how children think mathematically, right? There are resources out there like Educate or the Play Playful Learning Initiative that are really amazing resources for teachers to use to find technology that they can use in the classroom. Um, I just found a really, really good one um, from the Common Teacher Program that is sort of, you know, it's a teacher-based review site, and I found, you know, to my surprise, SokiCom was listed in the top five. <laughs> so they seem, they seem to know what they're doing. Um, in, in terms of teachers really finding products out there that they can plug in and use in the classroom and then adapt uh, on their own. Um, what, what, what is tough, though, about technology as we're in this world of, um, you know, increasingly research-based games and technology we can use is exactly how we can implement it. You know, as teachers, you know your needs are very different than every other teacher's needs, right? And you have a district a scope and sequence sometimes that you have to follow. <clears throat> you have all sorts of other assessments, and you have all sorts of other uh, responsibilities that you have to deal with, right? And elementary uh, teachers, sometimes, as math teachers, we, or as math educators, we forget that you have to teach other subjects, too, right? So there's all these other things that you have to juggle on top of just teaching math. Um, so when, when we look at the sort of the, the, the gamut of what, what products are out there, you know, we, we see that there's a lot of good products, but some of them don't necessarily align completely with research on how children learn math. Or they don't align to ways that teachers can personalize or individualize the learning process for their children, right? Every child is different. Every child comes with different prior knowledge, and yet you can't just throw a blanket, uh, you know, animation or video to someone, right? And we know that children learn a lot from their peers. In fact, they actually learn more from their peers than they learn from their teachers, right? And yet, a lot of times, games are set up in ways where it's a interface that sort of mimics what a teacher would do and this delivers content to a child, as opposed to allowing children to work with each other, 
Right. So, you know, now that we're in this world of Common Core and, and, and new standards that have been coming out since the NCTM standards in 1999, um, you know, what exactly, when we really look into it, are products that are aligned to these things that are actually using and connecting to the research behind Common Core and not just aligning to Common Core with the Band-Aid approach. So, you know, one of the reasons that I like working with Sokicom is I, I think Sneha and his team are very open and, and, and adaptive to, to these needs. So I'll turn it over to him to talk about some of the methodology they use. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chow. Um, so as the kind of Dr. Chow was, was talking about, some of the things that we looked at were the way that uh, a lot of these games of the past, um, as engaging as they sort of were, some of the uh, maybe gaps they had in terms of uh, offering uh, younger students with meaningful learning. Um, now, if we kind of peel even further and look into um, how were these uh, products actually developed? Um, so, um, it, it really causes us to look at one of the sort of development processes that uh, really uh, was was used by a lot of manufacturing companies, both hardware, software, as well as um, sort of curriculum and content development. So it's the, the waterfall method. And uh, the waterfall method is essentially a um, sequential development process. So imagine sort of a waterfall from the top, you know, the water flows uh, downward. Now, because it's waterfall, the, the, the water flows downward and the water doesn't come back up. So it goes one by one through each phase, and the idea is to fully complete uh, each part of the phase, or excuse me, each part uh, of, the, of the method, whether it's like discovery of the, the needs, um, designing, uh, then developing, and finally uh, testing. Now, um, what happens is, is that Sort of, and, and what we've learned uh, over the past uh, decade or so is that in the, the waterfall method, um, you know, the, the idea is to perfect the, you know, let's say if we're in the design section, the idea is to really perfect and complete the design and then go on to the development and not come back to the design again. And a lot of traditional research also sort of falls into that, right? Um, but what we find is actually when we develop a prototype, and we get actual people to use it or to give feedback on it, what we find is some of the assumptions um, and some of the requirements that we had earlier on in the process, whether it's in the discover phase or the design phase, those were incorrect. And traditionally, um, it's sort of like, well, let's just suck it up and that's, we just have to go and finish through it. You know, we have to do with what we've got and um, kind of finish through this, this current phase without the ability to go back to a prior phase. Um, and that model, unfortunately, resulted in um, a, a product that didn't, uh, a product or a solution, uh, or even a service that didn't really incorporate uh, feedback in the way that it should. Uh, an example of this, you know, a, a modern day example could be even, even textbooks um, or server-based software systems, uh, many of which can take over a year to develop um, and then before they come out with another version, you know, based on any type of feedback, it could take several years or more. Um, so that system, you know, really has, has a lot of flaws. And it was re really kind of the, the tech space um, that noticed that. And um, actually Toyota from, from Japan uh, began experimenting with what's called the, the lean uh, process. Um, um, and the lean process is this new sort of research-based approach um, now, it's typically, it actually started in hardware manufacturing uh, with Toyota, but since then it's actually been applied to, to software. Um, if you're familiar with the work of uh, Steve Blank at the uh, University of California in Berkeley, um, he's a, a several time entrepreneur and has done a lot of work in the area of uh, the lean methodology. There's also been several books that have been written about it, the lean startup, running lean, um, if you put lean methodology in Amazon, you'll, you'll get a ton of different books that have been uh, developed on this. And there are applications now sort of in the military and um, all kinds of areas, even sort of day-to-day uh, -day life applications. And essentially, the, the lean methodology um, it really introduces three major steps. Uh, instead of looking at the, the waterfall, we have the, the build, 
um, the measure, measuring what we build, and then learning, uh, learning based our, on our original kind of hypotheses. Um, so the part that makes this research-based is similar to any type of research project that's being done. What's sort of the first thing that drives the research? Well, it's the, the research questions or the hypotheses that we use, right? So the lean methodology actually has as its kind of cornerstone uh, its hypothesis-driven development. And based on those hypotheses, we build um, experiments, if you will, um, and then once those uh, experiments are actually, one thing I want to mention about the, that building, remember what we talked about in the prior waterfall model, the, the goal previously was to perfect or fully complete a phase and then flow down to another phase. Well, in the lean methodology, it totally flips that around. It's, it, it's um, the perception of perfect, uh, what, what lean teaches us is that perfect or fully complete, well, we don't even know what perfect is yet until we actually go through this cycle several times. So instead of really trying to build a perfect solution from day one, it's acknowledging, well, we don't even know what the perfect PD or the perfect uh, math curriculum looks like, um, but we're developing this framework to help us learn, to, to measure and learn. And over enough iterations through this um, cycle or this loop, that we will eventually get to what's, you know, close, as close to perfect as possible. And so it's not necessarily um, how much time or how perfect each uh, phase um, or each step of the lean methodology is, whether it's the build, uh, measure, or the learn, um, but how many times we iterate through it and the velocity in which we iterate through it, which is a key part. And each iteration through it should lead to um, improved uh, knowledge on you know what is really uh, working uh, and incorporating the feedback and a new set of research questions and hypotheses. Um, and what I want to do is kind of give an example of uh, an MVP um, and sort of uh, showing the difference between the older method where it's like through each of the stage, whether it's uh, stages, whether it's discovery or design, the idea was to fully complete it and to get it perfect, right? Well, Lean flips that around again and says that, well, instead of doing something perfect, we want to do with an MVP, which stands for minimum viable product. And let me kind of give you an example here um, to illustrate this. So, you know, let's say, for example, that there is a large school district. Um, now, before I actually get started, let me uh, preface something that the example I'm going to give uh, is actually not a traditionally thought of way of using the lean methodology. Again, remember, um, the lean methodology started in hardware manufacturing. Toyota started doing it in Japan, and then it got into software. But since then, it's been used in many different applications, um, from even day-to-day -day living to uh, uh, team-based type of uh, kind of organizational and, and team-based strategies, management strategies. Um, so in this example, let's think uh, that there's a, a large school district and, you know, we're, we're nearing the, the holidays. So let's say that uh, large school district uh, plans to send out uh, holiday cards uh, to over 10,000 uh, parents uh, in the community. Now, there are steps that I put over here that kind of are required to, to go through um, to, to complete this task. And let's say that in addition to the, the holiday card, that the district is putting together a community event that they want to get parent participation in. And so they're actually, in addition to the card, they're sending a coupon. Now, to save some, some money, the, the district is actually printing out the, the cards themselves, uh, themselves on uh, card stock. And there's a, a team of folks that are working on it. Now, if we think of this example and we think about, you know, what's the most efficient way to complete this task? Um, uh, well, one idea could be, well, we could have, let's say there's six people on this team and we've got six steps. So we could have one person specialize in, in each step. Uh, one person could um, really become efficient at 
going through all the envelopes, pasting stamps on them, return address um, labels, uh, destination address labels, and another person could get really efficient at uh, printing out um, all the um, different uh, holiday cards and the coupons, and another person yet um, may experiment with folding the cards, and after doing uh, several dozen, figures out, oh, well, hey, if I use this uh, little cool thingamajiki here that I can uh, fold it much faster, and you can get a lot of efficiency there, right? So that could be kind of one approach of doing it and, and trying to perfect each step individually. Um, but there's some problems that can happen with that. So with going back to the MVP and sort of the, the lean methodology, the lean methodology um, really emphasizes going through an entire iteration because we don't know what the perfect way to fold a card or the perfect way to, to do something until we go through the entire uh, cycle and ideally several times. So in this example, imagine folding the cards and folding hundreds of them and then finally trying to stuff them in the envelope and then realizing that um, the card actually protrudes from the envelope so you can't feel it. Um, so now if someone had gone through printing out all the cards, folding all of them, you know, like 10,000, and then finally trying to stuff them in the envelope, that's a big problem. Um, we would have to refold all the cards or potentially reprint them out. Um, another example that you know can show you some of the flaws of just doing it one step at a time and fully completing each step uh, before allowing yourself to go through all of them could be that because they used card stock um, and there was a separate coupon that they put in, um, a regular first class stamp isn't sufficient. Uh, only until they go to the mail envelope phase do they realize that they need to add another 10 cents to that. Now, imagine having gone through all that effort, putting all the stamps into 10,000 envelopes, folding the cards, stuffing them, everything like that, only to find out at the end that, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? We've got to go through every single envelope and put 10 cent stamps individually on each of them. So you're creating a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of extra work. So um, an MVP process would be to you know, really quickly go through all those steps and understand what the kinks of them, uh, of any of those steps are, and then iterate and learn sort of based on that. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, earlier that this has really uh, been seen as being beneficial to, to in terms of reducing waste um, and making things a lot more uh, efficient, and it's been adopted by a lot of companies such as uh, Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, on and on. Um, and, you know, now we can talk a little bit about the application of this approach in education. So, you know, if you look at sort of this slide here, um, you know, where can this lean methodology um, be applied? Well, it could be applied in curriculum. It can be applied in person-to-person um, -person, uh, PD delivery, right, without even any you know, product or any solution developed, just pure service-based. It can be used in assessments, information systems. Um, so it can be used in a, in a variety of ways. Um, and if we think back to what spurred um, and stimulated really the the whole lean methodology movement, it was a massive failure, actually. So in, in the private sector, I, I talked about the Toyota, um, but it was massive failure, failure from wasted resources um, of being, uh, being one of them. Another would be failure from being outdone by the competition or building something or providing a service, you know, that didn't provide much value. And um, ultimately, uh, if we look at the private uh, sector and try to see what can be learned from there, um, that uh, that failure came um, and resulted in customers essentially no longer wanting to buy products that didn't meet their needs. And in many cases, you know, they switched to other products that better met their needs. So that pressure really caused organizations to look at ways to be more efficient, ways to better incorporate um, user feedback and, and, and customer feedback into product development. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that the lean methodology um, may not have entered into K-12 yet 
um, is if we look historically, um, it hasn't been as easy to make changes uh, in K-12. Um, and it's for, for a number of reasons. Um, that whether that's, you know, changing to a new PD program, right? That's, that's, that's not simple to do, especially, you know, if you're looking at a large district or switching to a different math curriculum. Um, you know, textbooks, for example, generally are bought in five to seven year cycles if you've got the budget or else sometimes it can be up to, you know, 10 years or more. Um, so what that means is sometimes school districts can become tied down to a particular way of doing something um, even if, let's say, a year or a couple of years into doing it, um, um, let's say after a text adoption, if you realize it's not working, um, you're, you're sort of stuck, um, right? So that, that cost of sort of switching and changing is, is, is really taxing. And um, because of that, you know, it, it's made it harder to uh, historically sort of incorporate lean. And I'm using textbooks as, a, as just an example, but uh, there are many other uh, products or services um, that, that fall into this as well. <clears throat> now, um, another point kind of to bring up uh, there, um, just in terms of what are some of the barriers why um, the lean methodology and that research-based approach hasn't been used as much in K-12 yet. Um, if you look at the U.S. school district expenditures um, in some of these areas, uh, whether it's curriculum, assessment, PD, um, information systems, you'll find that a, a majority of school district purchases go to sort of the, the largest companies that have been around for a while. Um, and historically, uh, these, these companies sort of have developed products using the waterfall method, um, and so it's, it, which is cheaper and easier uh, for them to continue using that. Um, and you know, because of that, they'll sort of continue to develop in that model as long as that's what, you know, school districts uh, settle for. Um, and, and so, you know, what would be required to, to change or shift things? Uh, well, internally, um, you know, there need to be some kind of commitment to improving the quality of, of service, uh, whether it's um, a school district providing training um, and really being committed to ensuring that that training is, is effective, you know, and that could be hypothesis driven that um, the hypothesis of the research question a district may ask is that um, we believe that this new training that we're going to provide teachers will make them feel more empowered and prepared to teach uh, common core mathematics, for, ex for example. Um, and how are we going to measure that? You know, that could be measured uh, by surveys, by interviews, by things like that. Um, but that really falls into not only delivering the PD, but, but really building that PD into a model of this lean approach um, and, and the, this research-based uh, lean methodology. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit just about how we've used the lean methodology in, in SOPICOM, and then I'm going to um, kind of hand it back over to Dr. Chow. Um, so as we went through um, our own cycles, the hypotheses we created, we built experiments, then we measured, and then we learned, uh, some of the things, you know, we, we discovered that the teachers clearly, and being a, a former educator myself, um, there's so many things to do, uh, especially when you're teaching at elementary, you've got multiple subjects, um, that it can be very overwhelming, uh, a, a new initiative, um, and especially when we think about the common core, the increased rigor, a different way of teaching than how um, many teachers different uh, very much so than the, than the way they were taught as kids, all right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to uh, empower teachers, um, not, not overwhelm them. Um, we also saw having a deep common core alignment um, and not only sort of, uh, you know, having a, a sticker on a, on a product saying it's common core aligned, um, but having those you know, learning experiences be meaningful, um, having it be personalized, social, engaging, some of those things. Now, how did we accomplish that? So some of the things that we have incorporated, um, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about um, how we've done it because we've got a, a part two to this webinar. We'll be really getting in the nuts and bolts of um, how SOCICOM over the last several years has done our um, 
kind of lean methodology, if you will, by classroom visits. Uh, we do live usability tests. Actually, there's some teachers on uh, the call right now that we've done uh, usability tests with sort of all over the, the, the world. Um, and what we're learning from them through interviews, focus groups, surveys, uh, analytics from database logs. And that allows us, that data again allows us to go through that uh, build, measure, learn loop. And some of the development philosophies um, that a product or a PD is really never, ever complete. Um, uh, it, it's never finished. Um, and, and that's sort of one of these uh, philosophies uh, within the lean methodology. Um, so, last thing I'm going to talk before I uh, switch it over to Dr. Chow, um, I want to give just the, I've, I've talked, you know, I've given an example of the lean methodology with the um, holiday card example, but I want to give you just a, a taste of um, how we have used uh, the, the lean methodology uh, in, in one specific feature, for instance. So, what we're looking at right now is the current way that a teacher can add their own class to, to SOFICOM, let's say, when they're starting off. Now, initially, what we found was that um, a lot of products in the past uh, made this step um, quite cumbersome um, to the extent where sometimes it would take up to an hour just to add your roster into a new system. Um, and that uh, was so painful that many teachers weren't able to go beyond that. It left such a, a sour or bitter taste in their mouth that they um, kind of uh, just uh, avoided that, that program. And so the hypothesis that we made was that we believed that simplifying the add class process, which again is something that any program um, it is going to have a step that, that requires that it would result in more students experiencing SOHIGAM and teachers feeling a lot less overwhelmed. Um, and the way we measured that uh, was we looked at the percent of the total teachers that came into the system, uh, how many of those teachers actually added their class, um, and then uh, the percent of total teachers that were able to get their students into SOHIGAM. And then those were the, the quantitative uh, pieces of data that we looked um, in our database log. And from a qualitative perspective, we did classroom visits and we observed uh, teachers um, as they uh, added their class, and we did that via remote usability as well. And after several uh, of those uh, build, measure, learn loops, um, we, we were able to validate that we achieved that goal. And we got a pretty cool quote from, from a teacher uh, that said they should make statues of the SOHICOM team because she, she was one of those teachers that had spent something like uh, 45 minutes uh, adding rosters and she was to the point like pulling her hair uh, and it's like, you know, I can't believe this. And then when she went through our system, it put a huge smile on her face. And so um, that was sort of, and, and it, but to get to that point, it took us several iterations through the loop. Um, And I'm going to jump over this in the interest of time. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Chow uh, talk next about uh, uh, some of the impact and then also the, the, the research. So let me switch it over to. Thank you for unmuting me. <coughs> See how? Um, yeah, th thanks, thanks very much for that overview of the, the lean methodology. So <coughs> just, just to. Uh, Continue on then. So, you know, my role at SOKICOM is more as a researcher. So, I'm currently a professor at Ohio State. You know, I've been involved deeply with mathematics education research for the last nine years. Um, what, you know, as, as teachers and district leaders, I think one of the things that we have to be really cautious of is taking ideas that come from business and, and implementing them sort of in education without really understanding the ramifications for teachers and students, specifically for, for our kids, right? We can't play with our kids as if they're guinea pigs or, or research subjects because they're, they're the real children who really need all the mathematical support they, 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 they deserve. Um, so I think one of the intriguing things about the way something comes on about it is that, um, you know, Sneha and the team has done, has done a really good job of making sure to listen to the teachers directly, you know, implementing these loops that are very quick and short, you know, and then also then building them back in the product. So the Sokinga product now looks very different than 
what it looked like when I joined the team, you know, when I came on to help them a year and a half ago. Um, with that said, what we're doing now is we're building sort of SOCICOM for teachers. So that's sort of what I call it, right? You know, and the team probably, you probably have a different name for it, S3, right? Uh, a a game-based curriculum. But essentially what it is is something that is built that's a teacher interface so that teachers can actually use the games um, in their teaching, right? And I think, you know, this, this sort of opens up the door for uh, many, many great things that, if you're done carefully, are really revolutionary in the way that, um, you know, mathematics games are, are, are done. Because oftentimes the teacher interface is, you know, thought as, a, as an afterthought, right? The example you gave of how hard it is to import student names into a, into a game or into a curriculum or into a piece of technology, sort of, it, it, it's frustrating, right? And it happens with almost any technology that we use as educators. Um, so, uh, in the spring, I think we're about to, so right now we're, um, we're piloting the way that this new sort of game-based interface for teachers operates uh, over this next year. And the next year, if I, if this is what we wrote in our proposal, is um, we have 20 classrooms that we're going to do experimental design on, and some of them are going to use um, the SOCICOM for, for teachers, and some of them are going to use, um, you know, business, are just going to do business as usual. And I think what we're looking at specifically is how teachers interact with the interface, what kind of learning is happening, but more importantly, the reason why I think SOCICOM is doing a great job with the, the lean methodology is when you take a business model directly imported into a classroom, oftentimes, you know, we can forget that teachers and students are humans too. And what is nice about this lean development methodology is that the teachers themselves see themselves as part of the process. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an amount of agency and empowerment that's built into teachers actively seeing themselves as part of the research, right? You know, as, as, as math and science educators, you know, I remember teaching so many lessons about the scientific method and how you have an hypothesis, you build an experiment, you design it, you test it, and then you come up with a conclusion, which, you know, a lot of the learning science literature has shown is actually not how a lot of scientific endeavors are, are discovered, right? A lot of times, we, you know, you just you, you tweak things and play with them, and then the discovery is not a big aha moment as much as like a, hey, that's pretty cool. Now I know something new that is going to help me with my future endeavors. And so that's sort of what we're doing with the research products here, right? So we have this big project that's coming up next year, and we're act, you know, we're we're looking at how lean is being being used um, in, in the, in the methodology of designing research. We're looking at how teachers are going to react and how teachers are using it and, and, and embracing this within their own teaching, so they don't have to take a curriculum and change their teaching for the curriculum, but rather be able to do curriculum that is based on their authentic ways of teaching, right? Looking at the ways teachers build discussion and orchestrate discussion in their classroom around games using visual models from the games themselves. Um, and also just how they create excitement in their classrooms, right? You know, we have children today who, <clears throat> I know a lot of my own research involves students making videos and using tablets and using mobile internet devices. You know, and, and, and <clears throat> a lot of you know, right, like almost all of your students now are coming in with their own personal devices, right? So how is are these games that students can access on their own devices and having the literacy to understand how to play these games on multiple devices, how does that change the way the discussion is happening within the classroom? Um, I think before we jump into the question and answer session, um, one, one thing that we are desperately looking for, really, is teachers who actively see themselves as curious about how their children work with mathematics and curious about how, you know, they can use technology in their own classroom that is authentic to the way that they want to teach, and authentic to the way that they understand mathematical thinking. And so we've had a lot of, you can see from the slide, we've had a lot of success in um, SOGICOM so far. You know, but, and, but and a lot of that is really sort of you know, anecdotal, teachers really excited, we have test scores rising, but we don't really have rigorous research to show you know, what we see in the classrooms. Right? And so that's where I've been coming in. We have this uh, Department of Education um, million dollar grant in which we're really actively looking for teachers to participate in run this in the classroom. So before we jump into QA, I'd like to just give a plug that we're still looking for teachers for next year. If you or uh, your district feels like they want to participate in this, please let us know. All right, super. Uh, Thanks, uh, Dr. Chow. Um, this is uh, Sneha again, and just wanted to uh, let everyone know if you had, you know, any questions of, of Jen 
if you want to, uh, Jen's been looking at the, the chat window to see if there's been any questions. Um, so it looks like Dennis um, mm -hmm. asked when he signed up about uh, the adaptiveness of SOHICOM. Uh, so yeah, we can talk a little bit about uh, the adaptivity that's built into SOHICOM. So um, initially when students log in, that uh, they can select from uh, four different math regions that they can enter. Uh, and each region kind of comprises and mainly uh, consists of a, a major mathematical domain ranging from geometry, operations and algebraic thinking, uh, fractions, and then measurement and data. Now they have um, the other domains also sprinkled within them, but those are really the core focuses. Now, when a student um, enters into any one of those regions, uh, the first thing they do is take a placement uh, assessment. Now, that placement is grade agnostic. So when I use the term agnostic, uh, what we mean by that is that it doesn't matter whether the, um, the, the student taking the assessment is a kindergartner or is a sixth grader. Um, it's all going to start at a very fundamental sort of foundational level um, of questions and it progressively gets more difficult. And then once the algorithm determines that there are a series of gaps, um, and that gap could be, you know, a couple of years behind grade level for students that might have, you know, some missing skills, uh, that at that point then the placement sort of backs out and then starts students in uh, an in, in individualized learning plan. So, um, the adaptivity at that point, there is uh, a sort of playlist, if you imagine that, um, and I realize, apologize for not having kind of screenshots here, um, but if you imagine sort of having a playlist that shows all the content that a student skipped based on their placement and then the next area that they need to work on. Um, now, within that, uh, if a student gets stuck in the sort of prescribed um, activity that there are different levels of scaffolding, they can get hints. Um, and if the hints really aren't enough, then we also have instructional videos um, ranging from like 30 seconds to two minutes that are specific to the, the, the skill that they're working on and it provides that instruction. Um, so that's kind of the, the level of uh, support. And then within the questions themselves, um, the questions progressively get more difficult after students um, answer them correctly. And then only after sort of mastering that do they proceed to the, the next level. Um, hope that answers your, your question, Dennis. Uh, any other questions? Oh, dude, there was another question that came in um, about using game-based strategies to increase motivation and then also using it as a means of assessment and evaluation. I don't know if you or, or Dr. Chow can speak to that. Um, I can talk about the motivation part. Maybe if you want to talk, uh, Dr. Chow, about the assessment evaluation piece. Um, with the with the motivation part, there's a there's a growing body of, of research, uh, both from you know just pure academia, university research, as well as kind of partnerships from industry, like Nintendo uh, did did a study with the learning teaching um, um, University of Scott. Scotland, this was a couple of years back, that uh, showed some um, statistically significant sort of improvements in time on task um, when students kind of learned math through, um, I believe it was their um, a, a, a brainage, I think it was, brainage or brain academy or something like that, um, versus students that kind of just did their, their regular warm-up uh, worksheet uh, practices. Now, What's interesting is that, uh, you know, that time on task element, we have also um, in preliminary sort of smaller scale uh, studies, um, we've also found a pretty significant increase in the way that we're divide, uh, defining intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation, um, you know, referring to what the students internally um, compels them to want to do something versus, you know, external factors being extrinsic motivation. So what we found um, when we did a, a study in Tempe, Arizona in 2010, fall of 2010, I believe it was with third, fourth, fifth grade students, um, 
that the students that had access to SOCICOM at home versus students that uh, didn't, um, students voluntarily spent an average of two hours over the course of uh, two and a half weeks uh, voluntarily without any instructions on SOCICOM. And so that, that extra time on task um, was, was pretty powerful. Um, and that, again, was, it was a short period. It was a two and a half week period. Um, but as Dr. Chow mentioned, we're really interested in doing, you know, a, a larger scale rigorous type of study. Um, and, uh, you know, some other stuff I can talk about that I don't want to uh, kind of take up too much of the time here. But uh, if, if you've seen the, the, uh, some of uh, Daniel Pink, what he talks about in his book Drive or his TED Talk, you know, the, the, the three core things he found whether uh, being autonomy, mastery, and purpose, um, we, we actually looked at that uh, significantly when we were designing uh, SOHICOM. So um, the, the world that students kind of go into, they have a level of autonomy to choose whether I want to work on measurement and data or fractions or operations and algebraic thinking. So they have that level of autonomy. Now, we recently, um, to, to help kind of integrate it into the classroom, allowed teachers to override that when they need to and assign specific things but it's sort of balancing that autonomy with what needs to be done. Um, and in terms of mastery, um, one of the great things that games do and have the power to do is reduce the distance between effort and reward, right? And that's a really, really powerful thing. Imagine even, you know, if, uh, if you're trying to do something new, whether it's learn a new language, um, you're trying to uh, stop a bad habit or you're, you're trying to start a new exercise routine, um, that the, the distance between the effort we put in and the reward we get, if that distance is too long, many times we give up, we, we quit. Um, so games have a really beautiful way of being able to acknowledge progress at these micro levels, uh, which keep uh, students you know, at this zone of proximal development and um, also allow them to persevere through problems. Um, and, and the last part, you know, the, the purpose part, having uh, the whole peer collaboration, the multiplayer components we saw were um, really uh, powerful because then when a student is on a multiplayer experience, right, that there's this almost this social obligation that occurs um, because you feel that your success doesn't only impact you, but you are contributing to this larger uh, team. And that made students um, care even more about, you know, their own progress and spend more time practicing. Uh, so I hope that answers some of your questions on the motivation. I'm going to let Dr. Chow talk about the assessment and evaluation. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, one of the holy grails within um, education games is whether or not they actually motivate students to and what they motivate students to do, right? What, is the motivation for the student to play the game or is the motivation for the students to learn the subject that they're doing, right? So, you know, the, the hard part, and, and I always talk about this is, you know, what's, what's we've done in the past is research with a lowercase r, right? We've talked, we look at it, we see students are excited, we see they're motivated to play the game, we see they're motivated to learn math, but how do you then translate that into uppercase research? You know, research in which we have, you know, very rigorous frameworks for exactly what we're studying so we know we can pinpoint exactly what's happening. Uh, in the classroom, and that's a little bit harder. There, there have been a lot of studies that have looked at motivation, and there have been a lot of studies that show that games are really good at motivating students to play the game. But is there is the motivation there to learn math a little bit more or to understand math better? And I think we have an inkling that that's happening, but there hasn't been a lot of research studies that have been able to pull that out. And so I think one of the things that we're trying to get to in our biggest study next year is are we increasing students in their ability, not just and then in motivation, not just to learn to play the game, but also to understand the mathematics. Now, in terms of assessment and, and evaluation, um, I think one of the hard parts is that we, we, we're sort of caught in between two worlds, right? Mathematics traditionally has been assessed where if you get the answer right, then that means that you understand the mathematics, right? And we know as educators that oftentimes that's not true. We can give quiz after quiz in which students get nine, year, nine out of ten questions right. But we sit down with them one-on-one -on -one to ask them how they thought the question or how they solved it. Oftentimes, we'll get them rehearsing a procedure or mimicking something without a true understanding of what they what they did. So, how do we then, you know, move from this paradigm of only right answers to looking at student strategies and understanding the strategies correct? And that actually is where gaming culture is is really good, right? In, in games, 
you know, students have more autonomy. Students have the ability to understand and, and process other people's strategies. Students have the ability to play with things. These students have more of a connection to real world, you know, what's an immersed world because they can see the mathematical principles that happen in real life as opposed to seeing them on a workbook or seeing them, you know, on, on a worksheet. Um, the research is still really new on this. And I, I think one of the things that we're trying to do is, you know, teachers who are actively thinking about this stuff oftentimes have the most insight into how we can build assessments directly in a game that's not just based on right answers, but it's based on evaluating children's thinking, right? And we anecdotally have seen a lot of this in the classroom. We're hopefully going to see this in the research center. So that's, that's my short answer to that question. <laughs> All right, terrific. Do we get uh, any any more uh, questions? Yep, we've got one more from Jared from Boston Public School. Um, and kind of to piggyback on that last thing you were talking about, Dr. Chow, um, he's asking about is there a component of SOPICOM or even just some research about how um, that allowing teachers to understand misconceptions that students have as they build knowledge and supporting students to explain their reasoning or explain the why behind their answers. Um, so I'll, I'll take a, just a, a quick stab at this, and I want to let Dr. Chow talk more about it. So uh, what's exciting, and it was uh, Jared from Boston Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jared. Um, so what's exciting is this new project that uh, we recently were awarded by the Institute of Education Sciences, which is sort of the research branch within the U.S. Department of Education, is essentially to, to help teachers um, and through this platform uh, that allows them to use gaming to provide uh, not only instruction, but to help them better understand uh, the misconceptions that students might have. Um, you know, like uh, the, the common kind of incorrect answer of uh, one half plus one third would be um, two fifths, you know, and, and why does that happen? What are some of the, the common misconceptions? But not only the common misconceptions, also, the, the discussions and the conversations to have around that um, and the different strategies to use to, to really um, have conversations within students and, and um, really kind of powerful um, experiences there. So um, this we're actually doing a, uh, a small study um, next month. Well, it's, uh, I think, in about three weeks, uh, just the week after Thanksgiving in Oxnard, California, we've uh, teamed up with the Rio School District uh, there and we will be doing a, a prototype version of, um, of, of assessing kind of how well this, this new uh, platform for teachers uh, allows teachers to um, really uh, be able to understand these misconceptions that students have and have uh, conversations with them. Um, and I should say, it's not only with Oxnard, um, California, it's with, I thought, Clayton Hill, uh, who's the principal of Roosevelt Elementary in Desert Hand. Sands Unified School District in Indio, California. We'll also be working with some of their teachers to do that research. So that's happening in about three weeks. Um, so we're very fresh on this. Um, and that, again, is, a, is a, going to be a smaller scale, um, kind of anecdotal type of uh, evidence that we're going to use then, thinking about the BML lean methodology, to then really gear up a, a larger scale study. So I'll let uh, Dr. Chow talk. Uh, Sure. Um, th thanks very much for this question, Jared. You know, I, I think one thing that we know in math education research um, over the years is that, you know, um, Jim Hebert's talked about this a lot, Tom Gardner has talked about this, is when you're a math teacher, you have to know that within every wrong answer that a student gives you, there is some good thinking, right? So understanding exactly why a child made an error, understanding exactly why a child arrived at the wrong answer, that often leads you to understand exactly how the child is thinking. And in analyzing the, the misconceptions or the errors, sometimes you see that the misconceptions just are, you know, simple arithmetic or simple miscounting, but all, or sometimes it, leads, it shows that there's a major misunderstanding of how things go, right? How do you go about building this sort of error analysis, right, into your teaching practice? And I think that's what, you know, SOPICOM has the potential to do. Now, it's not perfect. I don't think any technology platform has really done this yet. But by allowing and, under, and, and helping uh, teachers to see where students are getting problems wrong, by allowing teachers to really um, jump into interviews with students, and also allowing uh, teachers to pinpoint where those go, 
without having to bring a student up to the board to embarrass the child in front of the classroom so that they can understand exactly what's going on and then present these misconceptions or these incorrect strategies to the classroom for discussion. And we know that these are, are, are traits of good teachers, right? But how do you give tools for that so that all teachers can do this in their classroom? And I think that's something that we've been trying to get at in the math education research community for a long time. We have the potential to to, to, to come close to it with some of the things we're doing with this new research in, in SOCICOM. And, and more specifically, it, it's just really how do you get teachers to discuss strategies in the classroom so that all strategies, whether they're incorrect or correct, are valued, and that way you give an agency and empower children's mathematical thinking so that they know that it's okay for them to make mistakes as long as they continue pursuing trying to solve problems. So that's, that's, that's my short answer. <laughs> Great. Um, any other uh, final questions? Yeah, any other questions? Um, all right. Well, I think we're we're good. We're right at kind of the wrap up time. Well, again, uh, thank you everyone for joining. It was great. We had uh, some. We actually had some international folks. Uh, Des from Zagreb, Croatia. Um, uh, folks from Wyoming, from California, sort of all over the country. So uh, really glad to, uh, that, that you were able to join, both Dr. Chow, myself, and Jen. And for, for those of you that weren't able to join, um, we'll have this recorded. And part two, we're going to be doing in December, right? Yeah, we've got part two that will go into the nuts and bolts. And what we're going to have is actual teachers that provided the feedback, and then we'll, they'll talk about, you know, how we incorporated that in how we actually um, had these conversations with them. So that's in December, and we'll uh, send you out an email with more information on that. But uh, thank you again, everyone, for, for joining. And thank you, Dr. Chow, for, uh, for calling in from Ohio. Thanks.